Since the early 90s, Bill Bratton has been running big city police departments from Boston to New York to Los Angeles and back to New York again for his second round as police commissioner. During his service, he's seen crime in the country drop precipitously. New York is no exception. The murder rate last year was the lowest in recent memory. Still, in the wake of events in Ferguson, Baltimore, and Staten Island, the scrutiny on policing is more intense than ever. And all eyes, as always, are on New York City. Three cops have been killed in the line of duty here in the last six months. And tensions between City Hall and the NYPD has been fierce since Eric Gardner died in police custody last summer. Bill Bratton was on the New York Ideas stage a year ago with Atlantic Editor-in-Chief James Bennett. The two are back together again to talk about the intervening year and what it means to be New York City's top cop. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioner Bratton, thank you very much for being back with us. Um, Great to be here with you. I, I, I guess I'd like us to start off kind of where they left things. It was a little hard to hear backstage, but Michelle was asking ta about the talk they give their kids, and, and part of that talk is about preparing them for how to deal with the police. But you lead the New York police. It's a force of 35,000 men and women. They make almost 400,000 arrests a year. It's your second tour doing this. You led the Los Angeles police in between. You were many roles. The transit police here, um, uh, and before that, many roles in the Boston Police Department, where you started, right, in 1970 as a patrolman. And you were a military policeman in, in Vietnam before that. Your whole life has been um, adult life um, among police officers. And I wonder, how, does it, how do you react to that? Does it, d does it seem rational to you that a parent would need to have a conversation with a child saying, here's the right way to, to behave around police? Does it, does, it, does it upset you? How do you, just, how do you well, think well, about actually, that? Actually, how I react to it is irrelevant. Uh, it's really how the parent feels they need to uh, work with their children and uh, so this was a very controversial incident when the mayor, uh, shortly after the uh, Ferguson decision was arrived at, made that public comment. Mm -hmm. There were a number of police union leaders who took some umbrage to it. Uh, but I interact quite frequently uh, uh, with uh, African Americans, uh, and to a person, every one of them indicates that uh, they have that conversation with their, their children. What's wrong with it? It's just the idea. I, I want them to understand that when you interact with a police officer, uh, you need to do what that officer asks you to do. And that, uh, uh, so there really is nothing wrong with that conversation from my perspective. I'd like to um, move ahead to some, a conversation about some of the measures you've been taking here to build trust generally with the community. But first, I'd like to ask you whether you think we have the right sense of perspective on the on the incidents that we've seen over the last few months in St. Louis, Baltimore, here as well. I was very struck by something you said at the funeral of Brian Moore, a police officer who was shot and killed um, just this month here in, in, in New York. You said a handful of recent incidents, fewer than a dozen, have wrongfully come to define the hundreds of millions of interactions cops have every year. So can you give us some sense of, of, of what you see as the context well, it's, here it's, for these incidents? What's going on in America right now is unfortunate that uh, there is no doubt that in the social media age that incidents uh, have a magnitude much larger than they might have prior to the ability to have video and to have all the social media uh, uh, expansion of an incident issue. We have 850,000 police officers in America, uh, and in the course of their making arrests, in the course of them attempting to perform their duties, there are going to be incidents that occur, sometimes accidental, sometimes incidental to an event, sometimes unfortunately incidental. A cop making the wrong decision, a bad cop, a criminal cop, uh, we don't deny that we have them. That's why we have very active internal affairs units. But we can't let 
the actions of the few be exploited by some to try to define American policing. I'm sorry, I've been in American policing for almost 50 years now, and I think I've got a pretty good idea of what it does, and what it does, it keeps this country safe. And the vast, vast, vast majority of the men and women of the police forces around the country join the department for the right reason. They want to help people. They want to do good. And by and large, in the course of their days, they do it very well. And a number of them, unfortunately, like uh, uh, the young officer you reference, lose their lives in the course of the performance of their duties. So uh, I refuse to allow a number of incidents, a half dozen or so, to be uh, used as a platform for those that don't like the police or have a social agenda or are seeking to institute reform to exploit them to the extent that those incidents come to define American policing because that is not American policing. But you, you've been, a, just to be clear on one thing though, you've been a huge advocate for a long time and practitioner of, of bringing technology into the police department and using it as a tool to improve policing. Do you have concerns about the technology in the hands of citizens, that people are taking videos, that they're using, um, that they're tracking the police and, and then sharing what they see through social media? Or do you think it's a largely a healthy thing that's helping hold all of us more accountable? It's a great question. It's ironic. I just, uh, had the meeting before I came here uh, at headquarters was discussing a couple of recent YouTube uh, videos that have been out the last couple of days. One involving two of my plainclothes officers who observed a group of young people, including one young person who pulled a false alarm. And while seeking to uh, uh, engage those several young people, do out a youth identification card, which would be the appropriate uh, way of identifying the person. Uh, they were accosted by a passerby who began castigating the officers, drew a crowd, the crowd began to get agitated at the officers who were effectively performing their duty, that they witnessed an individual pull a false alarm and was seeking to now do what you'd expect them to do, to do something. And eventually the police officers had to withdraw from that corner reasonably, because the crowd was now getting agitated and out of hand, including people who came onto the scene not understanding what the initial reason was that the police had stopped these uh, two young kids. We had another one that uh, recently up in, I think it's our 4 0 precinct up in the Bronx, where officers had been called to a fight in a park in an area where we had had four shootings in the previous week or two. And while attempting to break up the fight in the park, a large group began to gather around the uniformed officers and everybody had their cameras out and they were in the face of the officers while the officers were attempting to effectively break up the fight and potentially make an arrest. And clearly on the video, in the crowd, is a young man with a knife. He has the knife behind him. And God knows what he was going to do with that knife. And there it was clearly captured on the YouTube as other officers are arriving and the crowd around these officers, of everybody cameras in the face that basically agitating the cops, interfering with the cops attempting to break up the fights, that's what we're up against. There's a, there are so many cop haters out there now, and everybody wants to get that camera out and not record the good things that are happening. They're all trying to either incite or record an officer stepping out of line, or. I'm sorry that uh, policing is never pretty when it comes to physical altercations. It's, off, it's lawful, but it looks awful, even when it's lawful. And uh, we have this new phenomenon in the social media of this frenzy, out come the cameras, and they start interfering with the process that the officers are engaged in. Not to say that officers, uh, from time to time, some of them unfortunately do things the wrong way, unintentionally in some instances, intentionally, unfortunately, in some instances. But we are in this uh, strange new era uh, in America, and we're really going to have to be careful how we move through it, because the last thing you want to do is discourage officers from doing what they do do. They go toward the danger, they go toward the calls that are made to them to seek assistance, and you have to be very careful that you end up uh, discouraging them or disincentivizing them to an extent that they start shutting down. 
Is it, cha- is it changing your training practices? I mean, how are you preparing officers to function in no, that environment? Uh, one of the great benefits of policing is that uh, we have significantly improved our training over the now 40 some odd years I've been associated with policing. I was on the streets of Boston after 12 weeks of training in 1970. Uh, 155 pounds, skinny Billy Bratton with his six shot revolver, his six spare rounds, his handcuff, and his 12 inch club, and his ticket book. God help the citizens of Boston. <laughs> but I got through that process, fortunately, but I learned from it about understanding how inadequately I had been trained for the things that I began to encounter very quickly. My first arrest as a Boston cop was, believe it or not, within 14 weeks of becoming a cop, I was in plain clothes assignment looking for pickpockets in the subway system of Boston. And my first arrest with Frankie Corbusiero was of a young kid that we saw basically pickpocket getting onto a subway car. We pulled him off the subway car, Frankie's attempting to handcuff him. He's acting up for the crowd that quickly gathers around. And I'm standing there, I take my gun out because we're now surrounded by 30 or so odd people. Amazing how things don't change, that's almost 50 years ago in the situation I just described to you in the Bronx Park. Yeah. The only thing different, everybody in the Bronx Park had a camera. Thankfully, in that situation, which may have left, led to me, maybe possibly using my firearm, was interrupted by two uniform transit cops who happened to come on the platform and help to break up the crowd. Because God knows where it might have went with the lack of experience. So one of the reasons I've been so focused on training, 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 is seeing how inadequate my training was as a young police officer starting in the streets of Boston. So one of the things that, with the strong support of Mayor de Blasio, we are doing is totally changing the training we're giving to New York City officers. We're totally changing how we train them in the academy. And going forward, every police officer in New York will go through five days of retraining every year, refresher training. Because up until now, we've never done it. That we graduate an officer in the academy, and other than specialized promotional training or firearms training each year, we really don't give them refresher training of any significance. We're changing that. All right, I'd like to move on to the question of some of the practices that you've been reevaluating and changing a little bit um, um, for the force. Obviously, you have been the leading practitioner of the broken theory, theory, the broken windows theory of policing for quite some time now, and you issued a really interesting report this spring on the state of broken windows policing here in New York. And one of the things in that, some, one of the things you showed in that report was what I saw as a very strong correlation between misdemeanor arrests over the last 22 years and the decline in the crime rate here in New York. Um, And you made the point that many of the misdemeanor or people arrested for misdemeanors did not go on to commit felonies they might have otherwise committed, and that's one of the reasons the, the crime rates come down. But you are moving away, is it, from making arrests for some misdemeanors. Um, and I'm wondering, how do you, how do you um, align that new policy with, um, with broken windows policing? How does it all fit together? I mean, for the edification of your audience, explain first broken windows. A concept that I was practicing as a police sergeant, lieutenant in Boston in the 70s, the 1982 George Kelly and Jim Wilson wrote a seminal article in the Atlantic Monthly called Broken Windows. Of all places. And it was an experiment that had been conducted that a car was, a new car was left in a, uh, uh, a high crime area and nothing happened in that car for a day or two, but when they broke the first window within a very short period of time, the car was stripped. And thus the idea that uh, broken windows, if you don't take care of little things, that big things may arise out of it. To give you a New York experience that's a, probably the most uh, relevant uh, one I can give you, And Malcolm Gladwell wrote his first article in New York Magazine on Tipping Point and then went on to write the book. And he was inspired by what he saw happening in the subways in 1990 in New York City. I had been appointed as the transit police chief. 250,000 people a day were engaging in the misdemeanor offense, $1.15. Remember when the fare was $1.15? $1.15, theft of service. To make an arrest for that would tie up my police officer for 24 hours. That's how long it took to process that arrest. So talk about a disincentive. As a result, every day more and more people stop paying the fare. 250,000 people a day out of the three million riders were not paying the fare, and the number was growing. So we developed a process where we could increase our numbers of misdemeanor arrests. 
And what did we find? One out of every seven people who was arrested was found to have an outstanding warrant for another offense. One out of every 20 or 21 was carrying a weapon, box cutter on up to Uzi submachine guns. So by making an arrest for this minor crime, we tipped the subway fare evasion problem because within a couple of months, the problem was reduced phenomenally. And we saved the subway system about $80 million a year. So by focusing on the little things, we kept those people who were carrying the knives and guns from coming into the subway system to possibly create a more serious crime. And the idea is, think of it from a medical perspective. You go to the doctor, and the doctor basically examines you, he finds a basal cell. He does an examination, and he treats that while it's a basal cell before it becomes a full-grown cancer. That's what we do with quality of life, that we attempt to deal with the minor crime before it becomes a major crime. The challenge is, like a doctor, doesn't want to overtreat the basal cell, give you too much chemo or too much radiation, he's going to kill you with that. That with misdemeanor and quality of life enforcement, what is the right amount? In the 90s, because the situation in the city was so bad, it required a lot of arrests. Now in the 21st century, with the city much safer, 80% less crime, 80% less robberies, 80% less murders, a lot less quality of life violations. The 8,000 open air drug markets are gone. Most of the street prostitution is gone. A lot of the aggressive begging is gone. That the circumstances warrant much less medicine. So the fact that the police have to engage in that quality of life control is a good thing. And that we understand that you cannot arrest your way out of the crime problem. Arrest is an appropriate medicine, but it has to be applied in the right amount. Fortunately, right now in the city, we can apply a lot less medicine, because the New York City of 2015 is not the New York City that I first found in 1990. Quick question of your audience. How many of you in this audience lived in New York City in the 1990s? About half of you. The other half never experienced the New York of 1990. You're experiencing the New York of 2015, which is a totally different experience that even where we are here, <laughs> they would have had signs in 1990, high crime area, run, that uh, <laughs> instead they're running down here to invest in these properties because they're worth so much now. And I actually covered your anti-graffiti campaign in the subways. I was a metro reporter for the New York Times. And okay. It yep. seemed unbelievable at the time that it would actually, because they moved from painting the subway cars, you frustrated them from doing that. They moved to scratching, scratch tagging the windows, invested in a new form of window, and just kept changing yep. them out. You constantly adjust to the changing pattern. And Malcolm but Gladwell's just, tipping point was to just conclude, yeah. as fast as something can grow exponentially bad, if you find the right medicine, in this case, arrest, you can reduce it and then use less medicine. And that's effectively what happened in New York. But so can we anticipate that the pendulum will ultimately swing back in the other direction again and no. that we'll have to go we back to? We won't let that happen. <laughs> Seriously, that, uh, the pendulum that your first question that is, uh, and I've been through this three times in my 50 years in law enforcement, the pendulum has started to swing this way of anti-police sentiment uh, a lot of uh, people, for a variety of reasons, seeking to build on that sentiment. But it will go back the other way again, that you'll have that awful series of crimes, you'll have that terrorist act, you'll have that crisis, and people will shake their head and say, what was I thinking? And come back understanding how important police are to dealing with terrorism, dealing with crime. The challenge for us as police leaders, for police professionals, is to continually seek to make the profession more of a profession, so that we're not putting people out in the street after 12 weeks of training, that we don't put them out to a very comfortable, they know what they're gonna do out in the streets. Um, I wanna come back to the question of the public's role in, 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 in um, broken windows policing in a second, but just one specific question. In terms of the decline in crime rate in the last 20 years, do you see mass incarceration have, as having played any role in that de decrease in crime, either from a deterrent effect or simply by taking some criminals, a lot of criminals off the street? That's a great question. Uh, an unintended consequence of the 80s and 90s, where we, in fact, did start putting more people in jail, built more prisons during the 90s, was that 
we put too many people in jail who didn't need to be there, particularly a lot of those people who were first-time offenders or people particularly around drug-related crime, and I'm not talking about dealing drugs significantly, but drug users, et cetera, the Rockefeller drug laws, mandatory sentencing. And much the same as we did in the 70s when well-intended that we'd let so many people out of the mental institutions and effectively here in New York City and other cities around the country created the homeless population. Because when they got out of the institutions, they didn't go into home treatment, they didn't go into neighborhood treatment, they went into the streets and the subways. So the unintended consequence of that good action was still living 50 years later with the homeless situation that on the streets is largely emotionally disturbed people. Similarly, we are now dealing with a large number of particularly minority young men in particular, who are now middle-aged men in some instances, who because of their prison background are not able to basically find employment and very often slip back into that life of crime when they come out of prison. No, the good news is that we've learned, and this is one of the reasons why I'm pushing so much, not to make arrests for the sake of generating the numbers, but quality arrests, arrests that of in fact of the most violent, the most uh, uh, predatory, and try to find alternative ways, diversion programs, other things that uh, might in fact keep a person from going right back into a life of crime. We're engaged in a very interesting uh, set of experiments in New York at, th at this particular time. And it's a good thing, because they're all intended to take advantage of what I describe as the peace dividend. The city is so much safer than it used to be. We are making so many fewer arrests than we used to have to make, and that uh, we are in a position to experiment with diversion programs, treatment programs, that are money better spent than spending it on prisons. I would point out, as the crime rate went down in this city, Rikers Island now has a population less than half of what it had back in 1995. The state prisons have a prison population about 25 to 30 percent less than what they had. And why is that? Because we changed so much behavior. We controlled behavior to such an extent with initially our arrest policies, but then our quality of life, continuing enforcement, that we now have many fewer people committing crimes than we had back then. There have been reports in the last couple of days that you're actually even considering a possible amnesty for 1.2 million, I think. Is, well, there, any, is there any truth to that? Uh, no. Oh. <laughs> all right, then let's move on. It's the old adage, you can't believe what you read in the papers. I, I'm still marveling at all the Googles that keep coming out, misinterpreting what, in fact, I said. And that is one of the frustrations with social media, because it just takes on a life of its own. It used to be just the, the newspapers and the TV and radio. Now you have everybody with the blog is out there. It's taking some it. of the pressure off the rest of the media. Yeah, I, I, I guess so. Mess, no, let, right now we are... ...with summonses dealing with uh, minor offenses. So from the chief judge, Chief Judge Lippman, down through the mayor, through myself as police commissioner, five district attorneys, we are all agreeing to gather together to once and for all try and straighten out the mess that the courts, the summons processes, the uh, whole record keeping system in New York City, it's a mess, an absolute mess. And now is out of this crisis is the time to fix it. So one of the comments I made about talking about things we might discuss in this coming together uh, is the idea that some of these warrants are so old that it might be better to give amnesty in some instances that uh, come on in and uh, you know get in front of a judge because you're still going to front of a judge, but just get rid of it. And we don't necessarily have to impose the fine or a jail sentence. The oldest warrant we have in the system is 1975, July 8, 1975. A fellow from Brooklyn who's now 64 years old uh, who was arrested back then for loitering. We, we cannot arrest anybody for loitering anymore because the Supreme Court has found that that charge is unconstitutional. So if that individual were to be uh, uh, engaged by one of my police officers as we're sitting here, if the officer ran a warrant check on that individual, he would be arrested for a warrant from 1975 for an offense that is no longer even chargeable. And he would probably spend a day or two going through the court process. Do we need to actually put somebody through that for something that's now almost 40 some odd years uh, later? So that's the amnesty question, the idea of 
once and for all, particularly with the capabilities we have in the world of technology now to, to accurately track this stuff and get all these systems to talk to each other. One area you haven't, you don't seem interested in experimenting as other jurisdictions are is with decriminalizing marijuana. Do you think we're making, it's another area where the pendulum seems to be swinging, at least mm -hmm. the debate has changed very rapidly in this country. You're going um, to go, unfortunately, in this country to uh, legalization of marijuana. The medical uh, legalization was the first step, something I supported because I think it's been fairly conclusively shown that many people do benefit. But California, which likes to describe itself as one of the healthiest states in the nation, uh, it's amazing how many sick people they had when they, le when they legalized medical marijuana. It, 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 would, it would rate at the top of the sickest states in the country. And we're seeing that Colorado, another country, state that celebrates its healthy citizens, well, based on the number of people puffing away out there, there's a lot of sick people. But no, we're, we're going in that direction. And, my concern is the unintended consequence. Might sound harmless at this stage of the game. Remember cocaine, when cocaine was first introduced in the 1980s? Powdered cocaine. Oh, great, you can use it on a weekend, go back to work on Monday, feel great. No problem. Remember crack cocaine, what it did to this city? We soon came to find that cocaine was incredibly addictive, particularly when they don't, they're not comfortable just leaving it in its original form. They go to crack, they go to smoking it, the, all the things that they derive out of it. Same for marijuana. Marijuana right now, the potency of marijuana grown today is a hell of a lot higher than it was back in the 60s and 70s. But if you notice, they're not content to just smoke it. Now they're making it into candy, they're making it into all types of, of liquid forms. We have no idea what the long-term medical effects are going to be on this drug, and here we are rushing headlong to legalize it. And in legalizing it, we're not even, you go to a pharmacy, why do you go to a pharmacy? Because that pharmacist is gonna control the amount of medicine that he is giving you for what the doctor prescribed. Nobody is controlling what you're getting, in what amount, and in what type of uh, uh, concoction. Uh, doesn't make sense to me, but that's the direction, unfortunately, we seem to be going. You concluded that report, and maybe ask you to end on this, um, this spring by saying that the police in the community have largely achieved the safety part of public safety. Um, and there's been some suggestion there and other stuff you've written and said lately that the public itself needs to play a more constructive or different role. And I just wonder if you could explain what you have in mind. Yeah, I, I use the term very frequently now, the idea of shared responsibility, that in our democracy, one of the great things about our democracy is there's a shared responsibility. We all give up certain liberties in exchange for the common good. And the police are the entity that's entrusted to enforce the law to make sure we all comply with what is the common good. Challenge for us, the police, is to do it constitutionally, not break the law enforcing it, to do it respectfully, to do it compassionately, and particularly in the concern of a country that is changing so dramatically in terms of our racial makeup, to do it in a way that we're not seen as uh, biased toward any of the groups that we police. The shared responsibility, however, is the idea that the community has to play its role. When I'm asked to or uh, demanded that I control my cops, my response is, I'll control my cops, you control your kids that uh, this is a shared responsibility. You can't leave the control of the kids to the cops or to the schools. It starts at home. So don't be complaining to me if you're not taking care of your kids at home. It's a shared responsibility. And it's something we've kind of lost sight of. It's easy to point the fingers at the police or the education system. But a lot of this, uh, it's about parenting. It's about responsibility and uh, so when I talk about we've got the safety portion of it down correctly, we live in a very safe city, probably proportionally as safe as it's been in a, almost 100 years. But the public aspect of it, we need more public involvement in expanding that safety even further. All right. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.